Hi, uh, thanks for coming. We're, we appreciate your attendance both here in the room and elsewhere. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Conrad Tucker. He's one of my new friends here in, uh, in Coyle land uh, and uh, one of the people that I'm really happy uh, is working with us. And I, I really like what he's doing. He's, he's calling for collaborators. One of the things we offer as Coyle is the ability to help you find other people who can help you do important work. And that you know, we have all kinds of people here at Penn State, but there's so many of us that we often don't know each other. So I really appreciate you being the first really to say, I'm looking for collaborators that can help me do this. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. Tucker and turn it over to him. Uh, Dr. Tucker is the director of the Data Laboratory, which stands for the Design Analysis Technology Advancement Laboratory. And he holds the Hearts Family Career Development Professorship in Engineering Design and Industrial Engineering at the Penn State University. I guess with this crowd, I don't need to say the Pennsylvania State <laughs> University to do it. His research takes a multidisciplinary approach to engineering design that aims to discover novel, previously unknown design knowledge through the synthesis of data across multiple domains. With a strong multidisciplinary educational background in mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, business administration, and computer science, he's proposed a grand vision aimed at revolutionizing the manner in which design knowledge is acquired and integrated into the design process with a specific focus on sustainable design. Dr. Tucker is part of the inaugural class of the Gates Millennium Scholars Program, funded by a $1 billion grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and remains active in the program through national volunteer and mentoring programs. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Conrad. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, I want to start off by uh, thanking COIL for uh, setting up this opportunity and for providing uh, support throughout the years. Um, the support that co the, uh, COIL provides goes beyond funding. Uh, as you can imagine, it's very rarely, as Kyle mentioned, that we can get together as researchers and identify uh, tangible opportunities to uh, collaborate. So what I'm going to um, present today uh, spans beyond uh, myself, of course. There are multiple faculty that have been actively involved in uh, this research, in addition to both uh, graduate and undergraduate students, that without their uh, input, uh, we would not be where we are uh, right now. So the motivation for this, uh, this call for collaborators stems from an upcoming NSF uh, proposal opportunity uh, with a, a letter of intent uh, on May 11th. And so this is an integrative proposal uh, that can fund up to 2.5 million over the course of uh, three or four years. And there's so many faculty and researchers at Penn State that are doing such great things in the uh, space of online learning that uh, it, it's good to come together and identify areas of synergy uh, because this specific proposal calls for that. It's an, it, it is not only demonstrating the feasibility, but actually um, showing that it, uh, uh, the technologies that are integrated have been tested and proven, and there's a track record of the uh, collaborators to actually uh, integrate these technologies in their research. So I'll go ahead and start uh, the overview of, of today's talk. I will start with the background and motivation um, and look at the overall methodology that is being proposed for uh, what we're doing. Um, I will discuss some preliminary results that hopefully we can continue to build upon before the proposal deadline to show as evidence that uh, what we're proposing is indeed feasible and also uh, scalable. And then, of course, uh, we will have more of an interactive uh, discussion where we identify areas of synergy and, um, as the title says, identify collaborators. So. Uh, the best way to understand this is to just take a very high level view of uh, information dissemination. And so the famous model proposed by uh, Shannon, I think, outlines it quite well. Whenever you have information being disseminated, uh, there's typically a source of that information. Uh, there's uh, an encoding. There's a channel in which that message passes, a decoding, and then uh, a receiver. 
So if we look at the education space, the message that we deliver is uh, in, uh, education content, et cetera. The feedback we receive is the feedback from the actual students or the feedback from the university. And typically, feedback is quantified uh, through SRTEs or in the online space, uh, feedback through text and, and form, uh, MOOC data, um, or surveys. So who are the sources? Well, the sources are the educators in this specific context. The, the message here is the uh, content that is disseminated across uh, channels. And so the channel could be the physical space such as that which we're in right now, or it could be a virtual environment uh, such as a, a MOOC. So typically, uh, in the context of, let's say, engineering design, the physical context would be uh, there is a class, as a group of students. You give them a, uh, an activity such as the uh, dissection of a particular product. And the reason why this activity is done is because that there's learning when students actually touch and decompose and assemble um, products and understand how different components connect to one another, et cetera. So there's you know, well-documented evidence of the value of activities such as um, product dissection. On the uh, digital space, we have content that is delivered through, let's say, YouTube videos or uh, online lectures or uh, paragraphs and readings. This example here is showing a uh, digital uh, design file being shared, let's say, in, in the United States. And a student is accessing and interacting with that content uh, on a completely different continent. But the digital space allows us to connect in ways that we cannot in the physical realm. And then finally, we have the receiver, the recipient of that information, uh, who are the students in this case. And our focus as educators is to uh, enhance the quality of uh, student uh, learning and student outcomes. Now, the, gap, the knowledge gap in this stream of source, message, receiver, as we move from uh, physical environments to digital, is understanding what modalities of sensory input are critical for different types of uh, learning outcomes. So you have the five senses here. And you, uh, on the right, you have the actual uh, um, biological systems that are responsible for uh, connecting those uh, inputs to our, our mental model. So for preliminary studies, uh, we've explored two research questions. Uh, the first is, what effects do digital hands-on learning have on student uh, design knowledge and overall performance? The second is, as you vary the quality of uh, information being disseminated, uh, what is the impact on how people receive it? And so let's take a look at how we first set up this. So this was the first COIL uh, from 2013 to 2014. My co-PIs were Dr. Kathy Jackson and Dr. Gul Kramer, um, and what we what we did was uh, see whether or not there is actually a, a tangible uh, difference in students that only have interactions with uh, digital artifacts and students that actually can touch uh, digital artifacts. And the specific experiment was the design of a uh, a coffee mug. So some students actually got to um, hold and interact with physical coffee mugs that we brought in. Some students only got to interact with the coffee mug in a digital form. And then they were tasked with actually designing the uh, CAD representation of, of this. So preliminary results, we, we've published several papers um, pertaining to the outcomes here. We did notice uh, s uh, significant differences in some of the uh, metrics, such as the time to complete, um, the students uh, learning and uh, feedback in terms of the quality or appreciation of both physical and uh, hands-on learning activities. 
when it comes to the second research question, in terms of given a space like this, everyone is at different distances from uh, myself, the uh, source of the information. Now imagine if I saw the clock at very low, and no one can hear me. The quality of uh, right. So you're you're already there's already been a reduction in the quality across the recipients of that that knowledge. So when you have physical environments, um, due to the manner in which uh, information is disseminated, as you are farther away from uh, the source, there is a decrease or a variation in the quality of, of the content. And so if we model this just using these two data streams, so you have audio. Imagine if we were in a 200-person uh, lecture room, and I were, were at the front of the class I was describing this clicker. Well, in terms of the uh, visual quality of you know, the 200th person, that would be different than the person uh, sitting in the front. So we actually ran uh, an experiment where we varied, uh, so we s replicated uh, information being disseminated uh, in a classroom of 100. And not to, it shouldn't be surprising that the individuals in the front have a, uh, greater quality of both audio and visual information. But as you can see here, as you uh, move uh, farther away, there is a variation in the manner in which uh, that occurs. So that presents a potential opportunity in the digital space because you can standardize uh, information. But in addition to uh, both these types of inputs, the question is, all right, we know that there are differences. This specific call is looking for uh, integrating technologies that will either uh, enhance the cyber physical learning process or uh, show evidence that there are, are differences. So we first wanted to, out of these five senses, uh, start exploring or developing technologies that could actually have a tangible impact in minimizing uh, these differences. So if you, if you take a look at a, the typical MOOC environment, so that would be on your left where you have a screen in front of you, you have some type of content being delivered, and this is what we're calling non-immersive uh, environments, as opposed to immersive environments where you have some type of embedded system where uh, that gives you a 360 degree view of your environment, such as uh, an Oculus Rift. So before you start proposing whether or not to integrate some of these technologies. We want, one of the fir first measure if there is even a difference between uh, task performance across these two groups. So we created a uh, virtual classroom. This is, uh, this, um, this is a fully interactive classroom. Um, some uh, members here have actually had an opportunity to, to visit the lab and, and, and uh, see it in action. But for those of you who have not, um, you know, you have a wearable headset. And so this is not limited to the Oculus, but since they are kind of like the dominant players for now, uh, this is the technology of uh, choice. You're immediately uh, um, propelled into this 360 immersive environment. And it's very difficult to uh, experience without physically having it on. But we're going to try to at least show what it looks like and what the student is, is doing. So I want you to um, take a look at uh, the student's head movements and actually what is going on on the screen. So this is what the student is seeing. In fact, when they actually have this on, they're not seeing this double image. It's just one image as if you were, uh, you know, had a binoculars on, for example. So the reason why it's fully immersible is as a student turns their head, and I apologize the choppiness of the video, I think it's the streaming quality, but as a student turns their head in different motions, you can see the different views of the classroom environment are presented without the student even moving or um, uh, having to navigate. This is just based on their uh, head movement. And in addition to just being able to observe the environment, the environment is uh, fully, uh, has interactive capabilities. So the physics comparable 
to what we would experience in the real world are embedded into this. And so here the student is doing something that hopefully we don't do in our classrooms, which is picking up a desk and uh, having a, a Jenga game uh, of sorts. So that's one. So the ability to look around the environment is achieved through the Oculus, but the ability to move back and forth or left and right. Uh, when this video was shot was with a uh, controller. However, we have moved on to uh, a leap motion, which provides natural hand movements as if you were doing this uh, in a natural environment. So uh, this is what uh, this is what the environment looks like. It's fully uh, objects can be interacted similar to the real world, but we wanted to test beyond just the ability to interact. We wanted to see whether or not uh, you could actually formulate uh, a, an activity in this environment and actually measure outcomes in terms of student performance. So what we did was so what we did was actually create so this is a, an activity that uh, we typically do in the brick and mortar version of uh, our engineering design 100 class. This is a uh, introductory level uh, freshman class that uh, introduces students to uh, the engineering design process. And one of those processes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is product dissection or assembly to give students a fundamental understanding of how different components connect in a product. So this is an example of uh, a coffee maker who wanted to assess students' understanding of the connections of those components in the coffee maker. So they were shown the coffee maker on the right. And uh, with a timer, they were asked to reassemble the different parts of the coffee mug. And if they did, you know, if they, based on how they combined the different parts, they would either um, get it right or not. And the, so the parts would not assemble if they were course connecting the wrong parts together and th this environment also is fully interactive you can you can knock over the coffee pot on the table you want to make it as real as the phys the physical thing is is possible and so we did experience a, a statistically significant difference between students that had this this immersive experience versus students that had the uh, traditional experience of interacting with online content using, for example, a laptop. And beyond that, we wanted to get students um, feedback pertaining to this, this technology to see. Because it's one thing to have measurable outcomes, but it's another thing for st students to find it beneficial or even be willing to adopt this in an actual uh, environment. So the, the immersive group had the 360-degree uh, view uh, made available through the Oculus. The non-immersive had the exact same uh, environment, but just interacting using a uh, computer. So as if you were just uh, right, exactly. And so typically, if you think of a MOOC, you have on-the-screen types of experiences and. Uh, you know, we want to see whether, if we're, if we're going to make the case that new technologies enhance learning, we want to start seeing where we should start the comparison um, and which technologies to uh, explore in the first place. So the two that I just showed you were uh, sensory based on the visual and also auditory. So you could actually embed um, sound in there. But there's, there's something very big that's been missing in online interactions, and that's uh, tactile. So I started off by showing the different uh, papers we've, we've published on understanding that there's a different difference when you interact and actually touch something. But so what? How do you close that gap? And so uh, now we're actually uh, exploring and actually developing, because it turns out that this particular technology that um, there's not a commercially available um, system out there that is uh, 
low, <laughs> low enough cost and, and has the potential to scale like the Oculus. Uh, and so what we have done, and this is from an, a, a prototype, and to uh, end of April, we're going to have the engineering design showcase. So we're going to see version 2.0 of, of this. But this is just a first prototype that showed the ability as you have this haptic glove. Imagine you had this haptic glove and you were interacting with the virtual environment. Now, right, right. And so now when you go to touch the coffee pot, you actually feel that it's, it's being, um, being restricted. So let's just take a look at and, and like I said, just take a look at this, and, and the, the new prototype is about half as big and half as scary. Uh, the goal is not to, uh, it's to actually have something that is feasible that could be used. Um, so this is just me um, experiencing the uh, resistance that the glove is creating. And imagine having, having a screen on there. And so the different red parts are the parts of your fingers or hands that are actually being restricted as you, uh, as you interacted with a virtual uh, environment. So go ahead. Yes. So we have to be careful when we talk about tactile, because there are many physical aspects of interacting with an object. For now, the sensation of weight is absent from the hardware. But the sensation that there's something, uh, there's a physical object in this particular environment, that's there. So, and that changes as the object changes in different locations. And in addition to that, imagine you were molding clay. You want when you squeeze the virtual clay for the properties to uh, feel mashable a bit. And so those are the types of tactile interactions that we are referring to. So you know, right now it's been presented in the context of engineering. But the, the reason why I wanted to um, you know, explore and see what other people are doing is to see the broader impacts. I think the more we can show that, that this uh, these kinds of environments cut across uh, different disciplines beyond uh, engineering. I think it, it has uh, a broader appeal and higher um, potential. So, um, you know, th this is a prototype that we've uh, improved upon, and right now we're trying to have this be the dominant manner in which you interact in this virtual environment. So um, to summarize, and we can open the floor for questions, the understanding or the development of technologies that integrate with uh, receivers in online environments is an open question. Because many of these technologies are at their uh, nascent stage. And the understanding of, you know, what can we, what do we, what can we get away with? Um, in virtual environments, or does everything we experience in the physical environment have to be replicated in the online environment for us to have uh, comparable uh, learning? And so there are many different research questions we, within this specific uh, uh, chart here that we can uh, narrow down on and refine as we uh, move forward with uh, this, this proposal opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned before, this, uh, this effort is, is, uh, is a multidisciplinary effort. It, it involves many different uh, faculty and researchers and, and students. So I would like to acknowledge everyone here. And I'd like to acknowledge COIL. And I would like to open the floor uh, for any questions that anyone has. Yeah. If you're outside and you have a mic, of course, I was saying all that without the mic turned on. We, we're going to pass a microphone in the room if you're outside and you have a question, just go ahead and feel free to turn on your mic. If we Have we enabled audio for everyone? So just go ahead and type it in the... Uh, okay, so 
Shall I do that? I go ahead and we don't have we won't be able to hear you anyway. We're we're not set up for that. So uh, we have a question in the chat box uh, that says, "Can we use the the mic to talk?" But before that, we had two questions. One from okay. Alisa Stevens at SUNY that said, uh, "What is the cost of an Oculus?" I gave my best answer, but I said Conrad will know better. Okay. So. The cost of an Oculus is, uh, for the version 2, I believe it's 350 or 300 uh, around that. Um, it plugs directly into a, a, a laptop. Um, assuming the laptop is not 10 years old or 5 years old. And the virtual environment that we've been using, which is where the core of the development is, is the uh, Unity environment. Uh, and the open source um, environment called OpenSim. Right now, we're developing in, in those parallel tracks, and we will make a decision at the end of the semester to, to determine which is the best virtual platform to um, move forward with. There was a question, so it gives you a sense. So the, the weight aspect, and which we're thinking, I mean, with, we've thought about adding magnets and, and other things. But right now, it's the sensation that uh, in the physical world, I, I, I'm restricted when I um, get this close to the object. What we've uh, created is a similar sensation using this uh, haptic glove. We have another question from uh, out in the world here from Venkat. She's saying, are you focused on the haptic device slash glove, or are you open to using COTS gloves? I don't know what that means. But so COTS means that. commercial off the shelf. Oh. And uh, we are not, the same way we're not uh, committed to the Oculus, as uh, the same way we're not committed to any uh, haptic device. At the end of the day, as researchers, we're more interested uh, and the knowledge gained from uh, testing these hypotheses. And so we want to see what the most cutting edge technology is out there, but it has to be something that can be convincing that it is scalable, right? So if there's a haptic glove out there for you know, $15,000, uh, yes, it may uh, meet the needs, but it would be difficult to make the case to the NSF that this could eventually be used in MOOCs um, if it costs that much. I think the Oculus, which is around 300 bucks, there's a, uh, you know, you could, one could argue that it would be analogous to buying a textbook or something else. I think it's an easier sell than, uh, but if, if you're aware of uh, a sub 500 or something like that, haptic glove, by all means, uh, please let me know. I think there's another question from Incon. Can I call into, who wants to call into a phone number? So the, the answer about calling into a phone number, we don't have a, any speakers turned on in this room. We could, we could probably set that up. We, we weren't ready for that, but uh, I could get some he could call my cell The phone. tricky part is, so we have a lot of computers in the room and a lot of microphones, and if we use uh, speakers from, the speakers and mic from different machines, they don't cancel each other out, and you get horrendous echoes. So we're trying to avoid the echoes. Right. So if, you, if it doesn't work for you if, you, if you can just type it into the, uh, the, the chat box, that would be great for now. Thanks. So in terms of longer trajectory of this research, do you see... Uh, virtual reality fully mimicking the reality, or do you see like potential, you know, like different interactions in comparison to the reality, to virtual right. reality, and creating whole new experience with this haptic or right. other using other modalities? Right. For so, before I actually tried on the the Oculus, for example, I was I was very skeptical that a device could be that low cost and be convincing when you actually use it. And uh, my concerns were uh, what, you know, diminished when I actually tried this uh, system. 
And to think that this is 2015 and we are currently at this point, I can only imagine where we will be as a society in 10 years from now. So I, I think that uh, online, uh, you know, these virtual reality technologies uh, may not replace everything in physical environments, but I think it adds a new dimension by enabling uh, scalability. I showed in my slide the, the variation in information in a physical environment. This is a constraint that will be difficult to uh, overcome. You know, when you can replicate a virtual environment and have people from all around the world log in, I think it's very appealing to, uh, and just have a computer, internet connection, and some type of technology, I think it's possible to uh, have scale. So they suggested they call you with it, and then you can just sort of repeat it to okay. the crowd. So. Yes. OK. I will communicate those questions to you. And I'm glad you didn't type it. It would have been <laughs> half the. But thank you. I will communicate the, the, que the questions to the group. Thanks. All right. So let's see if I got all that. OK. Uh, <laughs> So the um, question was uh, two-parted. The first part was um, talking about the what is our objective when it comes to um, hardware such as the haptic glove. There's an entire haptic community that looks at different types of haptic interactions. For, um, I don't know if some of you, there's a haptic device. I used it when I was in France where uh, it's like this joystick thing. and You can feel things like viscosity and uh, friction, uh, et cetera. So, you know, there are a wide range of different technologies. The question comes down to uh, fidelity and uh, scalability. So for the high-end systems, uh, they may have higher fidelity, uh, of course. And so the first part of the question was, are we focused more on fidelity or we focus more on the pedagogy of what actually happens in learning. And for, for me, the focus is on, on the latter. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're not committed to one form of technology. We just want there to be uh, availability of a technology that can help us test a hypothesis. And the hypothesis, um, there are many hypotheses that can be explored here, but the fundamental one is, is there exists a difference between in learning outcomes or some performance between uh, tactile experiences in the real world and tactile in physical world. Well, in order to test a hypothesis, you have to have comparable ma means of having tactile experiences, and that's what we're trying to explore. The second part of the question, um, which I forgot because I spent OK, so the second part was, uh, given different tasks in an online environment, how do you determine what the minimum fidelity is? And that is a, an open question. It may be that if you have an Oculus uh, on, doing a classroom environment uh, activity such as this coffee pot is great. But if you want to do a similar kind of study where you are uh, performing uh, some type of cardio surgery, the fidelity, the fidelity of that hardware or virtual environment may not be sufficient. But I think even answering that question uh, would be of high value to the research community to understand what aspects of physical environments should remain in physical environments and what aspects can be uh, kind of shifted towards more online uh, environments. You know, these are some of the Questions that universe. These are the 21st century questions, right? As universities try to, uh, you know, shape what their uh, mission and role is going to be in the age of uh, democratized knowledge. You know, you you can go on YouTube and learn a, a lot of things by just knowing what you're searching for. And so, the question is, uh, you know, if universities know that which cannot be replicated 
in an online environment, then we could focus on those core competencies in the brick and mortar environment, and we can focus on those in the online environment that are better suited for that. So the, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. So you're looking for collaborators. What types of collaborators are you interested in finding? Okay, that, that's a great question. Uh, from our lab, I think we, you know, we've, we've had uh, a good foundation when it comes to setting up a, a virtual environment, uh, uh, understanding how these different technologies integrate into learning. What would be very helpful is to get collaborators that have been active in uh, understanding pedagogy and let's say MOOCs, how do people uh, learn in online environments and how those differ. I think collaborators more in the online space would be uh, the focus because I think it would, it would definitely strengthen the case when we go to say that hey we are uh, you know here at Penn State we've been, we've been doing all this great stuff and here are the uh, researchers that are active in this, this space. Uh -huh. <laughs> in addition to researchers who are working in the online space, like massive open online courses and just mm -hmm. online learning in uh, more traditional classes, I'm uh, wondering if you're also interested in things like we have professors who study sort of informal learning, like museum right. environments and things like that. Right. It seems like the you know because they're those environments have more hands-on activities. Right. Uh, so online learning hasn't traditionally done what you're trying to enable it to do. Mm -hmm. But these online, I mean the informal environments people mm -hmm. might be other uh, good collaborators for you. That, that is, is uh, definitely the case. And um, it would be helpful if there are uh, individuals, researchers, beyond the traditional MOOC or online spaces that have had experience with all, already integrating some of these technologies in different uh, domains. That would be a tremendous value to this. All right, now it should be on. Um, so I got to play with your Oculus setup at the TLT conference. Uh -huh. And one of the things with the game controller part was it almost felt like the Oculus headset wasn't really necessary because other than like turning your head, um, most of the controls were still with your hands. Um, and so in that setup, it didn't really seem like the headset was giving you much in terms of the putting together the coffee pot. Um, and my familiarity with the game controller, because I couldn't see the game controller, mm -hmm. um, was, you know, meant that I got through the task a lot faster because I knew where the buttons should be mm -hmm. relative to where my hand was. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of when you have the gloves, are you going to actually be able to see your hand moving too? Because if there's a disconnect between the coffee pot sort of floating in space right. and you're holding the coffee pot, sort of the difference in feedback that you get through your hands versus what you're right. seeing can be kind of distracting or disconcerting right. if they don't all sort of line up. Right. And you know, those are some of the learning that has gone uh, along the way. So we did start off with uh, having uh, controllers just because that was the more dominant way of interacting in online spaces. Now we've moved to uh, leap or leap motion or a non wearable kind of uh, approach. And in this environment, when you actually put your hand, you actually see your hand uh, as part of that environment. So when you grab, even down to the fingers, you are seeing yourself. You see a, a hand. And you see that hand actually grasp the object that's in front of you. Uh, you know, that took a while to, to develop because, like I said, one would think that, you know, these technologies are so uh, nascent that uh, there, we, we didn't find uh, commercial office shelf that we could that were just plug and play, so we've kind of had to, uh, you know, explore and, and update things as we go on ahead.
So we have a question online that says, would you, uh, okay, we start, we'll have to run up a few. Sounds like the overall research question, determining what can and can't be effectively communicated in a virtual environment. Start there. Okay. So, that, so it's just saying it sounds like the overall research question includes, mm -hmm. at least, mm -hmm. determining what can and can't be effectively communicated in a virtual environment. So that is definitely uh, a knowledge that we would like to gain from this research. Um, what we would like to, to know is if we use brick and mortar learning as the baseline for learning, as we depart from brick and mortar learning, what modalities of sensory input have to accompany the online uh, learning space to achieve comparable learning outcomes compared to a brick and mortar environment? If I can learn how to put together or take something apart, in a virtual environment without the need for a, an understanding of uh, weight or gravity, for example, uh, this is a stretch, but let, let, let us assume, then you know, the, does the development or the integration of a haptic glove for that specific uh, domain may not be uh, as immediate as, let's say, the medical example that was, was provided here. So it's, it's that understanding and that knowledge of what needs to be replicated in online environments to achieve comparable learning outcomes. Thank you. So Lisa, again, is, is pointing out that Coursera is migrating to an on-demand environment with private virtual communities, sort of like breakout rooms mm. in MOOCs. So there might be a real opportunity there to sort of work with students supporting each other in mm. online groups. Ben Cat says, would you be interested in collaborating on, one, haptics dimension, and or two, alternative virtual learning scenarios, such as virtual dissection? I would be interested in both. And that is the whole point of, uh, you know, I'm glad that you could join us from uh, in, this, in this virtual meeting, because that is the point of this uh, meeting, is to identify uh, people that are interested in similar things and, and actually have tangible uh, collaborative opportunities moving forward. So yes. The, the progress in this space, could you, uh, one of my questions has to do with, so we're, right now it's a little strange and I, I had the, I also got a chance to play with the Oculus Rift okay. the other day and I enjoy every time I get a chance to do that. But I, I found myself almost falling over sometimes because of the, the reality and sort of, you know, you kind of lean in a way you don't really need to lean or something. I don't know exactly how to put my finger on what happens. Right. But, you know, that to see the change in that technology from two years ago to now and then to project it two years out and maybe two more years. Right. And so these, all these devices that are, seem so, um, you know, primitive mm -hmm. at this point, they are primitive. We'll right. look back on those relatively soon. And say that was uh, that was pretty. I, I can't believe we used yeah. to have this huge thing. You know, when it gets down to the size of glasses, and I think, you know, that's and, and that you know that's not far fetched. I, I as I mentioned, I think ten years from now, it, it's it's not unimaginable to think that it, it would have reduced. I would say I remember when <laughs> virtual reality was right. Yeah, right. <laughs> when it wasn't the norm. But now you wake up in the morning, you you know, you have some type of virtual. And you know, Google, uh, Facebook is thinking in this space, right? They just had that developer con um, uh, conference where they were showing their integration of uh, the Oculus and other virtual platforms into their ecosystem. Um, Microsoft has this dual augmented, the HoloLens. I'm not sure how many of you uh, have seen this, where they take a different approach where they project images on kind of like Google Glass, but they have a fully augmented system where they could uh, augment the virtual objects in this, uh, in this space. I think this is a re exact reason why we haven't really, in our lab, committed to a particular hardware. Things are just moving too fast, and we're more focused on creating the platform so that technologies can plug in to that platform. Otherwise, 
you will be chasing your tail because technology moves so fast. And, and somebody's got to do this pioneering. Might as well be Penn State yeah, with collaborators, well. right? right. There's some of you out there with collaborators. Right. And I, I think, you know, that would be appealing. If we can demonstrate across, let's say, you know, two universities, uh, the potential uh, reach and magnitude. And this is why even beyond, let's say, a mechanical engineering class, if we can show a completely different, like, let's say, chemistry or Something else that's not just uh, hands-on engineering, I think, will also demonstrate the, the breadth and the broader impacts of what we're trying to do. You're, you're also looking for collaborators who see a role for this to play in teaching their own domain right. knowledge. So when I think of this, I automatically go to sort of training applications, mm -hmm. like training auto mechanics or training uh, you know, welders mm -hmm. or something like that, where you've got hazards and you've got um, expense and but you really need to feel how tight I'm tightening that right. bolt or right. something so so some of those things I, I see uh, not necessarily some of many of the things that we teach so education versus training right is a you know, mind a bit descriptor there and I'm I'm gonna play the devil's advocate for, for this I'm gonna be critical of, of what we're doing and say if I'm a reviewer reviewing a proposal like this, I would want to see uh, the ability for educators to create content. Because you can create the, the fanciest of environments, but if it requires you know, computer science person to work on this for coding for you know, a semester, then the argument of scalability is, is diminished or is not as attractive. So what we've specifically tried to do in this this um, okay. so what we've specifically tried to do in this virtual environment is and, and that's what we're working on right now the ability for individuals to uh, create objects in the space and assign the characteristics of the object. So, if uh, um, a chemistry teacher wanted to say, if a student pours this chemical in this uh, beaker, uh, it should um, start having this type of physical reaction. Or if stu a student tips this over, it should break. And so, having educators with little to no technical background create content, just like educators create content. As long as you're an expert, you can create content in the real world. That level of flexibility should, should exist in a, in a virtual environment. So I'm wondering, too, how long it'll be before you can actually sort of merge realistic video with these things. So, mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, imagine a, the chemistry experiment mm -hmm. you talked about. If you mix thing A and thing B, mm -hmm. All of a sudden, toxic gases are emitted and it bubbles over and whatever. So that's one thing to simulate that, but it's another thing to actually do it once, sure, and then and then capture that in video and still then have people manipulating with the, the glasses and have the video sort of take off. Huh. So it, it might might be something in the future. You combine those two. Right. right. Uh, Roy, one of our colleagues uh, who's participating from a distance, um, made made a point that a 3D cup, like you showed in your uh, slides there. Mm -hmm. A 3D cup can be provided to a thousand students and can last a thousand years, whereas a classroom-based cup can be provided to one student at a time and may last three to five years. Or is there some he's uh, wanting you to comment on economies of, you know, making, you know, real devices accessible? Right. So I think that um, that's another dimension that. Uh, so this touches on the scalability aspects of online. Or, or virtual learning is that you can create this content that you see on the screen and replicate it many times. And another thing about uh, uh, online or virtual environments is that the concept of you know there there's some students that are uh, that have a fear of either going into a workroom for fear of breaking something, etc. Or even students, it would be interesting to see. Uh, how many students shy away from 
technical fields or different demographics just for the fear of things breaking. Um, when you have a, a virtual environment, there's lower risk and I mean, you could set up the experiment again and focus on the learning as opposed to the consequences of messing up. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to draw a connection here that I never thought I'd draw, but Second Life. Do you remember okay. Second yep. Life? Yep. I think that was the promise of that environment, is uh -huh. that anybody can go in, anybody can make things, anybody can do things. Uh, and they never quite hit that mark. You could go in and easily create shapes and snap shapes together and things like that. But they had their own scripting language, their own right. thing that became very challenging. So uh, I think this is, I never heard, I never, it never clarified in my mind until I heard you talk today about, you know, that's kind of the goal here is to create, have that same aspiration to create a place where anybody can come in and be able to generate things as long as they know their, their content. Right. right, without having to know that deep level of uh, programming expertise, 3D modeling, right. things along those right. lines. Now with Second Life, it turned into pornography and gambling pretty quick. <laughs> uh, and, and there are people that predict that's what's going to happen here too with the Oculus Rift. But you know, I think the, the other things here, uh, there are a lot of interesting applications, not just with engineering, but Ann Clements, who won our Open Innovation Challenge, mm -hmm. Uh, is looking to set up an environment with student teachers. Right, and I so you can her, yeah. go into a fictitious classroom, and, and you can use things like natural language processing mm -hmm. to have sort of your your virtual students present you with ethical dilemmas mm -hmm. and, and things like that that, that you, you really don't want to face for the first time in your student teaching, mm -hmm. right, and things like that. So yeah, very interesting. It's interesting stuff. You you touch upon a, a very uh, good point, and I think that's what. Uh, so I don't know where Minecraft fits yeah. in. With that, you know, Minecraft starts from a more of like a atomic level, and then you build build up. Um, but yes, eventually that is the goal, and and you know, Second Life did run into that, that problem. Right. So my, I guess Minecraft is. Would you say Minecraft provides that uh, ability to create? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> right. Yep. Share it. Yeah. Augment it. Right. As soon as Bart mentioned Second Life, actually, I, I, you know, I thought of Minecraft, but the, I think the huge success of Minecraft lies in you know making it simply version of reality instead of actually mimicking the whole reality mm -hmm. so like I think the maybe the near trajectory of virtual reality or oculus rift need to be something like that it's not like you know making people feel like they're in a actual environment it's more like they're in a new environment where it's a mixture of something virtual and something real and within that simplified and so like the role of educators would be mm -hmm. you know catching that essence of like what they need to learn mm -hmm. and embedding it into the environment but it's not the same as actually actual real environment mm -hmm. but it's still like something that can make students link the contents they learn or experience from the virtual reality into something that's outside, and through making through the process of making the connection, they can ha actually go through the process of learning transfer, and it could expand like what they learn. So like we could teach them the processes as well as the content itself. So that that's a very good point. Can you cycle back to the? So you bring up a good point, and I think this is what Vincat had also mentioned. How much detail or fidelity is needed depending on what you're trying to uh, teach? Let's say in this case, uh, you're trying to understand or teach students this concept of gravity. Well, you don't need to uh, design a plane, an aircraft, to teach the concept of gravity. Uh, these, these desks are, like I said, ready-made, but they actually have the physical characteristics of gravity. You could have individuals you know, pick up things, drop it, measure how long it takes to, to fall, 
and, and so you can you can teach the concept of gravity even in, in in these already existing platforms. So I think it depends on the complexity of the learning task and uh, and the fidelity that you want to achieve. Right. Moon. So even in, with the uh, educational Minecraft packs, uh, Mar I talked to Marcella Borge a little bit over at the TLT conference, and one of the things that the kids are doing is they're memorizing the step procedural steps that they have to do. But then you, if you ask why do you do this step before this step, it's the answer is well that's what the instructions said. So in designing the actual content, the actual education content of the, what you're doing. Like I can learn that I need to, in this coffee pot, I can learn that I need to put the handle on the pot before I can put the pot on the thing, but I don't necessarily know why that handle is important and what function that element has. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to be a little bit careful in designing the make your own lesson plans if it is ends up being too procedural versus actually allowing for yep. figuring out why this handle is important right. or something right. uh, else related to that, that to be able to make those links from the uh, game world to the real world, it requires sort of an extra layer of, you know, how do you get them to actually think and reflect on right. why that handle is important versus just the instruction says, I put the handle on clink, all right, I did my job, and now I'm going to be really good at clinking handles onto the, the coffee pot. Right. Um, so that is going to be, if you want to make something where anyone can input content, that content creation at you're basically making an educational video game and you're making physical gloves and you're doing, you know, the Oculus piece. And when you're writing a grant to say, I'm going to do everything that, you know, 100 labs have broken into little pieces, we're going to do them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You might have a little bit of over ambitiousness right. if you say we're going to start with making this totally customizable, you know, software piece plus add all of these other technologies on top of it, you might have to sort of break it into chunks of, if you're really interested in the gloves, say we're gonna make it for a specific application here, but step two would be to make the, you know, modifiable environment stuff, or right. we're interested in this, you know, for yeah. in two or three years, what we could actually accomplish is X, but in the long term, we can potentially do this stuff. So you have to think about what, in terms of the grant writing, what you can feasibly do in that time versus what your, you know, long-term, you know, career trajectory goals are. Right. That's th those are very good points, and I think this is exactly why we're here. Because I am under no impression to, to say that we're my lab or we're going to do it all. And so this is exactly the point. So I think Venkat's group seems to have uh, a lot of interest in, let's say, the haptics. So they could uh, take ownership of that component if they chose to collaborate. And, and so different groups could uh, take ownership of different parts that is their strength or core competency. And the, if you look at the specific call for this, it's called the integration grant. And I, it's, you know, it's two point, up to 2.5 million over four years. It's, it's supposed to be integrating things and it's, from the looks of it, it, it won't be an easy grant to write by, by any means. But I think it's, it would be an exciting opportunity to collaborate. Uh, and I think if we're successful, we could actually have tangible impact. Um, you know, we started with Oculus research in September or October. I mean, August or sometime in the fall. And look where we are now. And, and I think as long as you have people that are Excited, passionate about working together, there's an opportunity to be successful. And I'm seeing a, a sort of a combination of the immersive environment and the sort of a voice over the shoulder. Mm -hmm. It might sort of seem like the voice of God, you know, coming from behind. But mm -hmm. imagine if you were, let's, another thing I imagined in this was like learning to drive a zero turn mower. I have one of those mowers and it's got the two handles, and you sort of push one forward, and it turns, and uh -huh. so there's, that was a thing. And when I learned how to drive that, the first thing I did was almost run over my dog. Right? Oh boy! So, but I'm not saying that 
you know. But anyway, so it would be great to have a simulation for that. And then, hmm. but maybe I need somebody like over my shoulder saying, okay, now we go back to the coffee pot example. You put the handle on, put the handle on next because, or, and then the second time they try it, now why did we put the handle on first? Or are you forgetting something? But for that, you'd have to really be able to understand all the interactions that are happening in this place that doesn't exist, right? right. I don't know if you, you're, you're a gamer, if you've played video games. Uh, most video games don't start off by giving you step by step. The, the, the fun of a video game is exploration and, and making mistakes. And so in this example, for we did not give instruct. We showed the, the real coffee pot. So you know, if someone's trying to put together a piece and, and it's not working, or if some part, one aspect that people got wrong a lot was, for example, this plate, which is the warmer. Uh, they didn't know what to do with it, and, and so they made errors before they figured it out. So I think the instructor could embed some type of exploration in there. And you could always measure the parts that students are having difficulty. If you use the, the brick and mortar as the baseline, I think you could always compare, this is, how it, this is how it was done in a brick and mortar environment. And when you replicate this in the, in the real world, these are the areas that students were struggling with, or um, you know, I, I'm not sure if that. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, um, in our so I work with Susie Scherf in the psychology lab, and okay. what we're actually doing is in Unity, we're building a video game for kids with autism to learn social skills. Uh -huh. So the first thing we did was we got the Penn State Erie students as a senior project to start working on it. We said, make us an editor where we can go in and actually make our own levels as researchers who don't have experience. And we tried that for a couple of months, and we had like the amount of features we could put in sort of an editor versus what I could just have a programmer sit and do in the lab mm -hmm. made sort of the editor like totally unfeasible to put together in a sort of reasonable time scale that just, you know, instead of having my undergrads, you know, build a dialogue system that let us go in and customize it using an off the sort of off the shelf plugin for Unity saved us probably like hundreds of hours of work of trying to get everything together. Mm -hmm. And so um, from you know, sort of the content creator side of working with some of these video game platforms, the platform of Unity or um, the other Unreal mm -hmm. engines and whatever are out there make it a little bit difficult to actually make the sure. the user editor where um, like the um, you know like content creation tool right. seems to be much harder to make versus like I export this completed game. Um, and so if you're going to need instructors to actually edit a Unity 5 game in Unity 5, that's a much different system. And that's still going to require someone who can do programming. And you're going to have a really hard time exporting a Unity 5 thing that lets you plug in those as a user once you've exported a Unity build. Right. Um, and so that's a software limitation piece that we found to be particularly problematic, at least in the Unity system, mm -hmm. that Whoever was making the content still had to go into Unity and edit it, and then export a final build. So this touches upon uh, what, what Bart was mentioning earlier: the level of customization in real time in an environment. And I think until we can get to that point, uh, it, it's going to be difficult to make the case for the scalability part. And and that's something that is of great interest to me. So. One of the constraints that we have in the lab is that at the end of the semester, we want to have that flexibility. So uh, you give it to someone that is, is, is never coded before, and they have the ability to think of an interesting problem, of course, given some constraints, but be able to create uh, in that environment. Um, um, but I think even with tools like Unity, it's not that hard to get like an undergrad, you know, a second or third year undergrad can go in and create content um, even within the Unity system. Mm -hmm. So in some 
in some respects, you can think of scalability in terms of um, having enough of the scaffolding of the system together that someone could get a programmer to design content. Even at that level, it's still potentially scalable. So we can take you know, the game that we have mm -hmm. and hand it off to a new team and say, make new content mm -hmm. you know, using the art and the assets and the scripts that are already put together. Uh, find your own art and, and put some more in and use the scripts or whatever to add new dialogue. Mm -hmm. And here's how the dialogue system works. Right. So we can pass it from undergrad to undergrad within the lab. Yeah. And within a week or two, the you know sec second or third year undergrads can pretty easily go in and pop in yeah. you know assets even in Unity yeah. um, that we found was easier than trying to have like a no me with no programming ability have the ability to go in and create the content. Great. And I think you know computer science domains have been doing this for a while now. You know, GitHub, uh, where you have um, code or, or software that continues to build upon itself, um, I, I think it's definitely feasible. Um, that, that's the whole point is that, for example, I didn't know that you your group was working on uh, with Unity and, and, and virtual. So I think if we can minimize redundancies and, and it would strengthen our case Learn, you know, we can bounce ideas off of one another. Yeah, so, um, um, so I, my name is Elizabeth White in the psychology department. Um, and in our game, the first COIL grant we got um, allowed us to um, make a, a social skills game where uh, the teenagers with autism sort of have a first person controller in the environment and they navigate a tunnel maze and they have to talk to characters that use eye pointing or eye gaze cues to direct um, which way you should turn in the maze. And then the second sort of game that we're working on this, uh, this year with our second COIL grant is going to integrate an eye tracking device. So Toby makes for about $150, we got an eye tracker that just uh, clips right onto the, uh, the computer screen and interacts with the Unity software so that uh, the individuals with autism are going to be able to use their own eye gaze to make eye contact with the characters in the game. And then the passive gaze trigger system that Toby makes will make the characters respond appropriately to the person's eye gaze. Because one of the problems that That's we very have, interesting. one of the problems that we have for individuals with autism is we want them to look at the faces more. But right now, in the first version of the game, the faces are not responsive to the person. Right? You have to click on something, and then it plays an animation, and it feels really scripted. Right. Uh, but in the second game, once we have the uh, eye tracker actually working with the computer, which is a whole other problem to solve, um, we're going to be able to. They're just going to be able to you know, with the keyboard and mouse controller for physically navigating the environment, they're going to be able to look at the characters and they're going to respond. So they're going to actually do joint attention where they look at each other, they look at an object and look back at each other, and you can script that all with passive gaze triggers. So I look at him and he looks at the hat, right? And then I follow his eye gaze to the hat. And I was like, oh, this is the object that I need, right? And so you can uh, do all of that, ver you know, with eye gaze. So I look at you long enough and I trigger that event, and then it plays an event, and then I trigger another event here. And that's a whole sequence where I've done joint attention with a virtual character in the game um, that we're going to be able to use the eye tracking technology that is pretty soon just going to be naturally in your computers. Right. You know, in the next five years, all these computers, if the laptops are going to probably have eye trackers that could do that. Uh -huh. um, and so we're going for, instead of the wearable technology, we wanted to go with the eye tracker technology that Toby just partnered with SteelSeries to put these uh, I, cheap user eye, eye trackers out. So um, some of the entertainment video games are starting to embed that. So if you look at the left or right side of the screen, your character is going to turn. And when you look at the objects, they're going to respond appropriately in the entertainment video games. And we're bringing that into the educational space. Yeah, very, very impressive. <laughs> So one question I would, I would have is in terms of well, where we go from here. Uh, is there, could there be a, um, a 
Dropbox or something where those who are interested start to um, start chatting and, and moving forward. What I plan on doing from here is starting off with a the NSF one page summary and then those who are, in, who are interested can start putting together their uh, collaborative material. So perhaps we could start with a Google Doc or a Google okay. spreadsheet or something, mm -hmm. or a folder that people could join mm -hmm. that would uh, have the one pager right. and then a spreadsheet where they can put their contact information and maybe notes about their experience and certain things. Right, that, that would be very okay. helpful. Um, you want to put that together or do you want me to put that together? Why don't you send me the one pager and okay. put together the, a folder. Okay. And if you would like to be um, added to that folder, if you want to just type your uh, contact information name and, and the email address you use for Google Docs into the chat box or if you're in the room and don't have a device you can come put it in using my computer and then we will we'll harvest all those and make sure that when we get this thing open you're automatically invited and then uh, tell others so you know this call for collaborators we obviously can't serve every possible collaborator in one meeting but now that you know uh, talk it up and see if we can get other people. What's your timeline, Conrad, for the grant? So letter of intent, May 11. Uh, proposal is July, uh, second Monday in July, July 13th. Great. All right, anything else before we call this meeting adjourned here? All right, thanks to everyone. Thanks uh, everyone out there, too, in here and out there. Have a good time. and. Uh, uh, don't forget, put your name and contact information in the box here if you'd like to be added to the Google folder we're about to create. Thank you. All right, thanks. And goodbye.